to the ladies and gentlemen watching in our audience. This is what the document looks like. It's very familiar. It's going to take a while to load. Julia Ainsley has made her way to a camera. She's at the Justice Department. Julia. Brian, I've had some time to digest this. Reporters were given two notebooks of this size, as well as an appendices, which includes some of the written statements from the president. The redactions were lighter than we expected them to be, mostly for grand jury and for ongoing investigations. Some of the highlights include the fact that the special counsel did consult the Office of Legal legal counsel opinion that you cannot indict a sitting president. That counters what William Barr said to the president earlier today, that that was not taken into consideration. One thing the special counsel said is that in a traditional investigation, we would not have to think about the fact that we're talking about the president of the United States. But this changes that. So again, he's looking at that. They also go into several obstruction issues, and they give us a legal analysis of each. One of the things is that when the president was told that there was a special counsel appointment, he was told with the then Attorney General Jeff Sessions and his chief of staff, he sat back in his chair, said, this is terrible. This is the worst thing that's ever happened to me. I am effed. Talk about how to say that on air. That was spelled out explicitly in the report. And he immediately took action to try to get rid of Jeff Sessions. He was talked out of that eventually by people like Reince Priebus, who were in the White House at the time but he wanted to go forward with that. He was very angry, and he actually kept Sessions' resignation letter as a chokehold. There's very little mention of pardons in this, but they do get into other obstruction issues, many of which were public, things that the president did in public remarks, times where he slammed the special counsel's investigation. They say that those periods can be divided up into times where the president knew explicitly from Comey he was not personally under investigation, and then after it was revealed that there was an obstruction investigation. One other piece I'd like to mention is that after media reports came out that the president wanted Don McGahn to fire the special counsel, his then White House legal counsel, Don McGahn, he asked Don McGahn to retract that, to say that those reports were inaccurate. McGahn refused and said he would, he would resign over that. And then he, re, he would resign over firing special counsel Robert Mueller. And then when it came down to retracting it, McGahn refused, and the president continued to pressure his own White House legal counsel to lie. Those are some of the highlights we have so far. We're continuing to go through this, as I'm sure you are, too. But I will say right now what is countering to me is what the attorney general told us, that when Robert Mueller made this decision on obstruction, he did not take into fact that he was talking about the president. It's clear here through Robert Mueller's legal analysis, he did take that into effect, into account, and that it wasn't a normal prosecution that you would do with an ordinary citizen, Brian. And uh, Julia, just to back up, so we were right contemporaneously that what the president was doing and saying out loud in plain sight is now detailed uh, uh, under the guise of you need look no further than these examples. That's right. They say that part of the fact that a lot of this was out in the public means that it might not ac accumulate to be an obstruction count as it would in a different place because his intent is somehow more transparent when he's out there. And they, they do make reference to the fact that he had a political reputation to uphold. And so that's why he may have been so uh, dogmatic about, about continuing over and over again to go against these people, the special counsel, and to try to tear down everything that happened. But it's clear from reading this that the president was extremely upset with each turn of the investigation, and he did make efforts to get his own staff to lie about the investigation and what he was doing to shut it down. Um, thank you, uh, Julia. Just flag us. We'll come right back to you. Ari Melber, how is that different from me proclaiming uh, publicly, I hate you, I'm going to kill you? Does that make it less of a murder when I do it? Well, the, the argument we heard from Barr and the president's lawyers is, is that it was less illicit or corrupt because it was all just fuming, venting, et cetera. I think it's a weak legal argument. Uh, what I would add in looking at what we're learning here, because I'm holding copies of the report, and for viewers at home, uh, I, I don't yet know the range of the redactions, but I think it's worth showing folks as America comes to understand what we're seeing. Uh, there are some pages where you have 
these yeah. redactions. I'm working off a, a black and white edition. There goes our toner for 2019. And there are other pages that are very lightly redacted, meaning only in the, in the footnotes. So as we go through this today live, we're going to be able to walk through what that means. Those two pages, what does it seem the redactions are for? Can you tell? Is it yeah, so somebody's great question. name? Great question. Uh, they are very specifically labeled. Uh, so here we have a black redaction and red, it's labeled grand jury. That's the lawful stuff. That okay. is the, the strongest legal argument to redact. Then I've got a footnote 952 that says investigative technique in yellow. And that's saying in the footnote they want to basically hold back that information so as not to reveal how they got it, the investigative technique in plain English. The other point I want to make as we're understanding everything is we are learning here as we read this report together what they went through in looking at the potential election conspiracy. And so it's very interesting to give a summary. I think we're going to get into details later. Okay. But at a summary level, Brian, I'm going to read now from the Mueller report. Headline, Papadopoulos learns Russia has, quote, dirt in Clinton emails. Headline, Russia-related communications. Headline, Trump campaign's knowledge of, quote, dirt. So what we're seeing there and what we're going to report out for you over time is Bob Mueller's investigative narrative of these events. Uh, you have covered and, and many uh, watching at home may remember all the discussion of whether or not there was a quid pro quo to help Putin at the Republican National Convention. I can tell you the Mueller report has a headline, events at the Republican National Convention. Quote, Ambassador Kislyak's encounters with Senator Sessions and J.D. Gordon the week of the RNC and then a multi-page discussion of the change to the Republican Party platform. Uh, so what we're going to see very clearly here as we go through this, Brian, is the difference between things that were rumored or discussed and the things that Mueller sought to both investigate and detail. Uh, and we'll go back to how uh, unnormal it was to have Russians walking around Cleveland, Ohio, and the GOP convention. Nicole and then Matt Miller. One of the big questions we've had all along is what happened? Why didn't Mueller interview the president? He answers it in the obstruction report. Um, it says, we sought a voluntary interview with the president. After more than a year of discussion, the president declined to be interviewed. There's a redacted chunk. It says grand jury was the reason for redacting. Um, during the course of our discussion, they continue, the president did agree to answer written questions on certain Russia-related topics, and he provided us with answers. He did not similarly agree to provide written answers on questions of obstruction. Julia Ainsley, are you, are you still with us? Is that come close to offering one of the explanations for why Mueller didn't render an opinion on obstruction? Do you know what the answer is for why Mueller came to his non-conclusion conclusion on obstruction? He goes through many different details of this. A lot of them seem to be relying on the fact that this wasn't a normal person they were investigating. They say that because he was president, it made sense that he was using his Article II powers, powers that a president has that others of us do not have, like fi the power to fire your FBI director. They also point out that he was very worried about his political career and his presidency, and so some of that angst may have been factoring in. They also do talk about intent. Now, they don't say that intent has, that another crime, an underlying crime has to prove intent, but they do say the fact that there wasn't an underlying crime is one of the factors that they investigated. I'd also like to go through the 10 things that they investigated, the key issues of obstruction, if I could. Please do. Five. Okay, the first here, the campaign's response to reports about Russian support for Trump. Conduct involving the FBI director Comey and Michael Flynn. The president's reaction to the continuing Russia investigation. The president's termination of James Comey. The appointment of the special counsel and efforts to remove him, which from reading this, I have found the most interesting so far. Efforts to curtail the special counsel's investigation. This is like digging up dirt on him and his potential conflicts of interest. Efforts to prevent public disclosure of evidence. Further efforts to have the attorney general take control of the investigation. That would be the pressure on Jeff Sessions. Efforts to have Don McGahn, the White House counsel, deny that the president had ordered him to have the special counsel removed, as I previously detailed, and conduct towards Michael Flynn and Paul Manafort. I will say some of that was redacted because it could harm an un ongoing matter, hmm. which could be the, the further sentencing of, of Michael Flynn. And then also the conduct involving Michael Cohen. One piece on Michael Cohen I need to dive into some more, but they explained that Michael Cohen um, was someone who was mistold about these Moscow tapes and that in fact he had been lied to about the 
contents of them. So lots to dig into here, but Nicole, you're asking the right questions because they lay out this legal analysis. They get into whether or not the president had to have corrupt intent and know what he was doing. But in the end, it does appear to come down to that jump ball. And that sentence that we saw in the bottom line conclusions jumped out to me again today. This does not exonerate the president on the issue of, of obstruction. A another thing I'll point out is just the volume here. I mean, this is obstruction much thicker than what we have here on collision. It's a, it's a much thinner thing. They did the amount of information I have here on obstruction it is far larger. Julia, I'm stunned by this language here about the inconclusiveness, and, and this would show the limits and how hindered they were by not having an interview with the president. They were not allowed, or able to reach a conclusion about whether Donald Trump knew about uh, Mike Flynn's conversations with Ambassador Kislyak, which in some ways was, was the, the, part of the, the, right, the, the original sin. So I think this is a pull from the reports, from Mueller's report. Some evidence suggests that the president knew about the existence and content of Flynn's calls when they occurred. But the evidence is inconclusive and could not be relied upon to establish the president's knowledge. In advance of Flynn's initial call with Kislyak, the president attended a meeting where the sanctions were discussed. They told so many lies about that that it's stunning that it, it goes down to why they could not exonerate him. They could not clear him of what really was one of the original sins of the entire web of lies told by the most senior White House advisors at, at this time or transition officials vis a contacts with Russians. That's right, Nicole. And they also detail how the president told KT McFarland, who you can remember was on the transition and in the beginning parts of the White House, where she was a national security advisor, talked to Michael Flynn ahead of those Kislyak conversations. The president asked KT, asked KT McFarland to deny those conversations. She then took a note of it. She, they say that it wasn't wrong of him to talk to her about that, but she took a note of it because she knew that the request was so strange. But this part about him not sitting down for an interview view. Now, this was really interesting. They say that after a year of pressing the president and his legal team to sit down for an interview, they eventually had to decide that the written answers and his public comments and, and everything that was out in the open had to be enough to suffice that. But I think you have to go back to the fact that they're looking at the OLC opinion that says you can't indict a sitting president. So therefore, can you subpoena one and force one to sit down for an interview or for grand jury testimony? I think that's what really hinges all of this. The the obstruction question was handled differently because we're talking about the president of the United States. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.